now the floor is yours. Well, I'll share it with you, but uh, but I'm happy to hear some. And we've got a uh, a microphone, so I've only barely touched on some of the main issues. So, Jose, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. What, one one question. Uh, the, uh, part of the title is uh, of the conference, which is it was wonderful. Thank you. I'm preparing actually a, a couple of adults for baptism this um, this uh, uh, Pesach. <laughs> so Asuka, Easter. Easter. So, uh, but the, the, I I noticed that the part of the title is why Catholic. Uh -huh. yeah. So so the question is so and. Maybe I I I, I uh, misunderstood something, but there's that that's the same question that they have. Why should I be Catholic and not baptized in another church? Ah, good. Yeah, I would. Uh, yes, I uh, that that would have been another talk, and uh, it was the talk I didn't really want to give. But that's but but I'm happy to because it's the title. I'm happy to address it. Um, yeah, it seems to me why be baptized a Catholic? It's because of the. Uh, because, well, first of all, because Catholics hold that the fullness of what it means to be a church in Christ is is in the Roman Catholic Church. That we have the richest heritage, uh, and that's spread out both over the East and West, because uh, the Catholic Church has Eastern rites in it as well, right? the Melkites, the Maronites, etc. Um, that we have the the, the greatest richness uh, of uh, life in Christ. And uh, the best way to to follow him, which is not to denigrate. I don't see see that the danger in a talk like this would be to try to start denigrating the Lutherans or the Congregationalists or something. I have no interest in doing that. But uh, because the one baptism that we all share unites us far more than anything that divides us. But why be baptized a Catholic? Because it, it seems to me the richness of the tradition uh, that we have of our sacramental tradition. And there's nothing like that. I think, well, the, the Orthodox actually could give us a run for our money on it. But um, uh, the the appreciation of the sacramental, of sacramental elements. Uh, think of think of the um, the graphic way in which Saint Augustine talks about baptism. When he talks about the grains being ground, etc., and then moistened, because you can't really make bread without water, just like baptism, etc. He's really taking the things of this world. And talking about how they are used to make us into what we become and what we receive, the body of Christ. So that would be my main argument for baptizing Catholic. Please. Here you go. There's a. I just want to get back to the baptism of Jesus. Uh, what was his reason for being baptized? Of course, probably to identify with us fully as humans. I don't know. But he certainly was without sin. So could you enlarge on that a bit, uh, right, the purpose good. for his baptism? Good. That's great. I didn't get into that part of the uh, Eastern Christian approach to baptism, which very much focuses on the baptism of Christ. And as you say so correctly, he was without sin. So why was he baptized? Uh, and you also said, you answered the question, of course, in your own uh, questioning, uh, also to be in solidarity with us, right? as uh, Matthew makes clear in the Gospel, because it was a puzzle to the Gospel writers. Why would Jesus need to be baptized? Uh, for the remission of sins, that's what John's baptism was for. Um, but it seems to me that what, what's happening in the baptism is Christ receiving, in his, as, as human, his vocation from the Father and saying yes to it. In Mark's gospel, it says, uh, God says, the voice that comes from heaven says, uh, you are my beloved son. Uh, the gospel is a kind of a progression from that scene, because it's right at the beginning of the gospel, to the middle of the gospel, where uh, the transfiguration scene, that gospel, the Sunday after this, in the transfiguration scene, God says to the disciples, right, to, to Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved son. All of a sudden, God lets us in on it, as it were. Then finally, at the end of the gospel, uh, it seems to me, you receive, you get the culmination of this growing faith when the centurion, not even a disciple, a pagan, at the bottom of the cross says, truly this is God's son. So, uh, and it's the fate of his baptism. that, And he says also in Mark's gospel, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and he's referring to his passion and death. 
So all of this enters into their, their imagery. Uh, but the Eastern, especially the Syrian church, uh, concentrates more than anything on the anointing of Christ as God's beloved son uh, and talks about the baptism in those, those terms. So uh, that's part of that richness that I was trying to get at. Please. I just was wondering if you had an opinion on why we move from the of baptism as in being in union with God to the fear to more of the fear of um, that you know children would be in limbo or whatever. Yeah, good question. How did we move from this whole idea of uh, baptism as union with God, the more positive, to the more negative? Um, it's it's a strange history, um, in that uh, many people say that um, Saint Augustine argued for infant baptism on the basis of original sin, whereas what what actually happened is that he he argued for original sin on the basis of the fact that we've already baptized infants. You can see that from my quote that Saint John Chrysostom took a took a very different view to that. Right? N- nobody denied that 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 baptism was involved with conversion, uh, with finding a new life, with turning away from sin. Nobody denied that, ever, as far as I know, in the Christian tradition. So that element is always there. Um, But why, your question I think is, why did we forget the other element, the more positive elements? I think, uh, especially in the course of the Middle Ages with uh, the infant mortality rate the way it was, um, there was great fear, uh, and um, in, in harsh conditions of the, the Middle Ages, that fear became kind of uh, solidified in the Christian imagination, uh, such that what was important was that the child get baptized as soon as possible, right? because of the fear of death, or the possibility of death. And all those other things were nice add-ons, if you will. Even St. Thomas Aquinas says, it's not necessary to receive the Eucharist to be saved. Uh, but it is necessary to be baptized. Um, there's, of course, a great truth to that. But at the same time, it leaves a lot out. And it's the, a lot that was left out that I was trying to cover. Father, um... Please, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know who is first. Oh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, Father, uh, I'm going to ask for a little spiritual direction. Can you give some thoughts on how, practically speaking, we can live out our baptismal vows and promises, um, sort of how to wring the most we can out of the graces that are available to us, and maybe in particular, uh, you know how we cooperate with that grace. How what we have to do. I understand everything is grace, but uh, you know I can ask for patience. But if I don't practice patience, I'm not going to be patient. Uh, so <laughs> something about uh, what right. we have to do to cooperate with the grace that's available. Right. They say that the, the God who saved us uh, without our help will will not really save us without our cooperation. Huh? Um, and I think that's what you're getting at. Um, well, what are the, st- I mean, uh, I don't think I have anything brand new to tell you about that. I mean, uh, what's tried and true. Um, one of the things that's uh, important about Lent uh, is that we return to, or we remind ourselves of, uh, good, solid, solid Christian practices like fasting, some kind of bodily denial, which is, uh, is you know, I mean, you know, basically healthy, right? And, and reminds us of who we are, of our human condition. We turn to prayer, to deeper prayer. And it seems to me that it, if we celebrated the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the ongoing, our ongoing celebration of our baptism week by week, if we celebrated that correctly, with a real sense of who we are, our own baptismal dignity in celebrating it, uh, we'd be going a lot in the right direction uh, towards towards uh, uh, bolstering up those virtues uh, that you were talking about in terms of the Christian life. And then, of course, the third of the elements is uh, good works. 
works of charity. All three are necessary, uh, it seems to me, for the Christian life. Um, there's a kind of balance that has to take place in the Christian life. I didn't get into this. Uh, I was thinking of putting it in, but now you've given me the opening. Um, the, one of my, fi- uh, f- um, my favorite theologians, some of the, some of the David has been working on, a Frenchman named Louis-Marie Chauvet, uh, in his book Symbol and Sacrament, talks about uh, the tripod on which Christian existence rests. He says you have to have all three. And all legs have to be in pretty good balance to have a good, balanced Christian life. One is scripture, what we believe. Another is sacrament, how we celebrate. The third is ethics, how we live. And all of these have to be in a kind of balance. So it's, it's, I think we're always looking for a balanced mix of those three in order to, to, to appreciate the kind of baptismal dignity I was talking about. Please. I- I didn't understand what you meant by the sacraments already in the world. Yes, okay. Um, Good, because I did that very quickly. There was an older view, and that's part of the the Mark Cyril quote, that seemed to talk about sacraments as though they were incursions from above, you know, into an ungraced world, right? We live in a a terrible, sinful, sad, tragic, ungraced world in which God kind of, as it were, peeks in from time to time like rays of sunlight on a cloudy day. What people like uh, Karl Rahner are trying to say is, no, what God has made is good in principle. God has made nothing evil. Um, The the problem is not with God. (laughs) It's the problem with us and the way we deal with it, right? But that what God has made is good, and that the whole world and it, all of its struggles, people's struggles to be good, to be faithful, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's already graced. That there's grace everywhere. And it, this is, um, Bronner says that, and it's also a part of the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He's the son of St. Ignatius, a Jesuit. St. Ignatius of Loyola, one of his great uh, ideas was finding God in all things. And that God really meets us in the world, in our in our lives as they are, um, not in some imaginary world. That God actually wants to deal with you, not some idealized image that you have of you, right? or that I have of me. We all do. Uh, and so that what the sacraments are is that grace that's already there, coming to a kind of focus, a celebration, communally which at the same time helps us to live it more. It's like love, right? Love between two spouses, right? It's there, but if they never say it, right? If it never gets celebrated in some way, shape, or form, well, then you don't know that it's there. And once it's celebrated, then, of course, it gives new life to the love to keep on growing. That's basically the idea. People aren't asking the really hard questions, but go ahead. Um, The church teaches that when we are baptized, we become daughters and sons of God, our Heavenly Father. Um, So the question... I was in a in a class, and someone said, "Well, if um, God loves us so much, why not everyone else, not just Catholics, are the sons and daughters of God? What happened with the rest?" Right. Okay. Well, I'll go back to my friend Carl Rahner. This kind of dovetails with the question that was just asked. Um, The question you're asking in some ways has been phrased, framed as uh, why uh, is there no salvation outside the church? Um, and the question, I think one of the best ways of looking at it is there is no recognized, we, we, we Catholics, I don't think we make a claim about other people's salvation, right? about the fact that they are God's sons and daughters. But we do make a claim about our own being sons and daughters of God. That is not an exclusive claim, it seems to me. It can be an inclusive claim. 
And the theologian I was just talking about, David's favorite theologian, Chauvet, uh, draws a picture around those three elements of scripture, sacrament, and ethics, and it's, it, it's the church around it. And it's a broken line. He says, I, I, I make this into a broken line around the church, and then, of course, God is, you know, forms all of it. But I make this a broken line uh, because uh, to be a Catholic, to be a true Catholic, is to be open to the world really have this love, to be a true son and daughter of God is to be open to the rest of the world. And so in that sense, uh, to be open to evangelizing, uh, to helping other people to realize that they are sons and daughters of God. I have an easier question. You probably don't need sure, order to Eric. answer it. <laughs> um, I, I assume many of us were, had the, the Private baptisms when, when we were young. And I'm wondering if you can comment on liturgical practices, because many parishes involve the baptisms as part of, of the Eucharist, um, as part of the Mass, and others others don't. So maybe you could talk about those trends. Yeah, there's, okay, there's, there's three basic ways I think that we could talk about uh, how infant baptism is practiced today. Uh, and you can please correct me if, I'm, if, there's, uh, if there are more. One is doing it at the Sunday Eucharist of the church, right? Another is doing it privately, or a family arranging for a priest or a deacon to do it privately. Another is to do a communal baptism. A number of churches do it like everybody comes once a month and they do it on Sunday afternoon. A number of years ago, I was involved in one in New Jersey. Former college students of mine, um, uh, had uh, twins, premature twins, and um, they were baptized. They were really premature, uh, like 24 weeks or something like that. And um, they were baptized, of course, in an emergency baptism, as one would, right, in the in the, um, the hospital. But then they were brought to for the anointing, the clothing, the reception of the candle. Uh, they were brought to the communal celebration in this church in uh, northern New Jersey on a Sunday afternoon. And the pastor explained that they had been. And so the other ki kids were baptized, but they were also given the garments, etc. So it was wonderful, actually. Um, and the pastor really knew what he was doing. It was great. Um, at, in, uh, at Sacred Heart in Lexington, we have, have some of my friends showed up here from uh, Sacred Heart in Lexington, uh, we have what I think is a magnificent practice of baptizing babies at the, the main Sunday Eucharist. And um, but one of my friends, her mother, her 90-year-old mother uh, in a parish in Long Island, uh, some of her friends, as they were coming out of church, were complaining one Sunday when they had a baptism, you know, because it, took, it does take 15 more minutes or something. Okay, fine. What's 15 minutes? Now with the invention of DVRs and things like that, 15 minutes is not tragic. But... Um, they were complaining, and she said, how could you possibly complain about people being added to the church? You know? And I mean, that's the feeling I get, certainly the sense. Uh, my friends from Sacred Heart can, can, uh, can support me in this. That's the sense I have in a place like that, where the church is delighted. And this is, this is a healthy community. Now, this doesn't, this doesn't appear, this kind of a worshiping community does not appear overnight. Right? It takes years and years of hard work patience and development to get that. And would that all of our parishes were doing this. We, we can get there. We can do this. We can do this. It is possible. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to have a gorgeous church. You just have to be faithful and work hard at it. Good pastoral practice. And so here you have a church where everybody, you can just it's palpable, right, that experience. Then you have private baptisms, sometimes for very good reasons. Uh, um, sometimes people with adopted children. Or there, there's sometimes reasons, you know, that's, you know, I'm not going to make a blanket statement about, uh, about uh, private baptisms. Um, but the downside of private baptisms, and I'm saying, of course, I'd be willing to think about exceptions. But the downside of it is to think that this is just about our own family. 
I am not to understand that it's entering the family of Christ, the family of the whole church. That that it's that it's a a rite of passage only, uh, and not really incorporation into Christ. All these passive uh, positive things that I was t- trying to to underline. So that's how I that's how I would go at it. Well, you know, I wouldn't dream of wanting to make a you know an absolutist statement about private baptism. But I think the experience that I have in that Sunday uh, liturgy uh, with baptisms is just, you know, I wish we could bottle it and sell it. On, on uh, that, maybe one, maybe one, one more? more? Please. Um, so just one question I had is, you said that like a modern theory of baptism is that, or, you know, modern theological a viewpoint is that it's something that the grace is already there, although it's kind of a communal celebration is what baptism is. So I guess my question would be, is that idea compatible with the idea of original sin? Since God's grace is already among us, it's already upon us. We're just recognizing it through baptism. Yeah. Yeah. You were, oh boy, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, it's, it does force us to begin to think about original sin in a different way. It does. And I think, um, just reading a book about this now, and I, I can't give you the whole of the argument of it, it's Jack Mahoney, uh, a British Jesuit, called Christianity in Evolution. He, he tries to talk about, if we take science and evolution seriously, how does that mean that we'll rethink things like original sin? What I would say about original sin, if there's already grace, as you so correctly said, right, pointed out that, and I was making the argument that that we are already all loved by God. That's I think that's I I think it's indisputable, right? What does it mean then to say that by baptism we're freed from original sin? Well, it seems to me it says that we are explicitly enter into the community of Christ's disciples who are living in a world which is in principle freed from the, that sin. Because the best way, it seems to me, to understand original sin is not as something that's passed down, as it were, physically, which was an older image of it, uh, uh, but rather something that's part of our communal human condition whereby we have this tendency to reject God uh, in favor of selfishness. Um, And that is real, right? Sin. I'm not trying to say that sin is not real in the world, right? Sin is real. That is real. Uh, but God's grace is real as well. Uh, and what we do in baptism, specifically as Christians or Catholics, I would say is enter into that community of that beautiful, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that God has set apart, quoted from the preface, Eucharistic preface. We enter into that um, to, to take part, as I said, in Christ's mission. So, good. Thank you. Very good question. Great questions. Thank you so much, uh, Father Ronald.